So Bob, I got some emails for us to answer. I kind of did that like a song. Let's do it. What do you say? I say yes. Uh, this first is from a DM on Instagram. I'm not sure. From Morella. Morella uh, says, hi, I'm a fan of the podcast and a huge fan. Bob fan. Oh, thank you. I'm doing an EFT course. Oh, good. And our trainer was using this slide quoting Bob. Wow. I just had to share it here. <laughs> I'm based in Bucharest, Romania. Thank you for all you do with the podcast. Also, our trainer said that Sue Johnson often quotes Bob. End of email or DM. Sounds um, pretty so, highfalutin, don't it? <laughs> so Sue Johnson, if you didn't know, is the primary famous person with her brand of emotionally focused therapy or yes. EFT that we often talk about. And uh, as a huge figure in couples therapy, there's two figures in couples therapy of Sue Johnson and John Gottman. Oh, right. And so according to this person, so this person DMs me and is just like, Sue Johnson often quotes Bob, Bob Gettle of our podcast. Also, I'm, what, I'm doing this EFT course and this famous trainer is using a slide and it quotes Bob Gettle. And in my head, I'm like, no, because not that no one would ever quote Bob, but uh, Bob would have told me about this. Bob would have told me, by the way, did you know that Sue Johnson knows about me and quotes me or this famous trainer that is maybe the most famous EFT trainer uh, quotes Bob? Or, or anyway, I, Lori, we'll, we'll get to that. Wow, Lori is really cool. Yeah, uh, I would have. One, I was like, he would have told me that. Two, Bob doesn't publish anything. <laughs> Bob does not. He doesn't write books or publish articles. So what would you be quoting? You yeah. know, I'm just trying to think. So I, uh, you know, mess afforded this to you, thinking you'd be like, huh? I don't <laughs> understand. But then you're like, oh yeah, sure, that happened. Uh, so Bob, <laughs> what's up with this? So I was taking a training. Um, uh, with Lori Brubaker, that's my teacher. Um, uh, this is nineteen in two thousand nineteen, and um, she was talking about a particular part of EFT, and I made up a mnemonic to help remember it, and she liked it. I said it, you know, it was a class of what dozen students and and uh, two teachers, and um, she liked the mnemonic, and then she. She asked if she what was the mnemonic? So, so, um, so, in a conflict situation, each person is. It's like a game of tennis, right? So, what I do, you know, I hit the ball over the net, and then the ball comes at you, and you hit the ball back, and that's what people do in conflict. And the, the actual bits of that are, what what does the other person do? What are they doing that I'm responding to? So, what's the cue? And then what, what do I feel in my body? Like what's my limb? They call it a limbic appraisal. It's just like, how does your body physically respond when you get the cue? So what's the cue? What does your body do? And then people make sense of their limbic appraisal with their, you know, cognitive head. And so uh, those people, the EFT people call that a cognitive appraisal. And, um, um, you, another way people talk about it is what's the story you tell yourself? Yeah. Yeah. So your partner is a little quiet over dinner. Yeah. Is the cue. Your emotional response is one of fear. Yeah. Your cognitive appraisal is he's an asshole. Or <laughs> angry with me or who yeah. knows what, right? Yeah. Right. So what's the cue? What does your body do? What does it say to you? And then the last bit is what's your action tendency? What do you tend to do in response? Because hmm. there's a very good chance that whatever your action tendency is, is a, it's the cue for the other. That's what completes the cycle, hmm. is I hit the ball back over the net to my partner and then off we go. So so the whole mnemonic is... Your attachment style or your conflict attachment style. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're right, because you can have all your sort of tendencies um, rolled up in that. So So the whole mnemonic is what's the cue? What's your body do? What does it say to you? What do you do? And now own that it's true. Because the step in EFT is to slow that down and just say, here's what's going on for me. This is so funny. Just a side note. Whenever I, so I, you know, I've never been educated in EFT yeah, I know, I know, officially. Right? Yep. And when I first learned about it, 
20 years ago, 25 years ago, I learned it and I th- a little bit about it and I was like, oh, I've been doing that already. Yeah. And, I, and I didn't invent that. No. I, I was basically on attachment theory and object relations right. theory and psychodynamic theory and humanistic, you know, the, sure. th- the same integration that Sue Johnson, that Sue Johnson and, and, yeah. and Leslie Greenberg were using. But a, um, a slightly different integration or way of sure. talking and a very, very different way of terming everything. Yeah. And uh, as you talk about this, um, I also describe it in this way. So if students are listening right now, they've heard me talk about the stimulus and the emotional response and how we evolved to have these emotional responses to certain rejection stimuli or atta- or proximity stimuli. I, I use more, I think, Bowlby language. Um, but it's just interesting to, and again, I didn't invent it, but nope. it's just uh, hearing someone else integrate the same things that I'm integrating, but to have this fancy kind of, and I've always had this slight kind of resentment to EFT. I have noticed that. <laughs> yeah, because they... Are they? They claim that they invented it. Yeah, I know. And they claim that they have the monopoly on yeah. this language. They, and I'm like, no, you right. don't. This was right. a, a, this has been around long before Sue Johnson yeah. ever put pen to right. paper. Yeah. And God bless you for doing it. And, oh yeah. And, yeah, and and good on you for. Of course, you should uh, sell your books and and spread the word. But don't claim that you're the only one. It's sort of like how. E, EMDR claims to be the only form of trauma therapy. Yeah, and no, it's like, it you know, God bless you. Good. Spread the word. Trauma therapy. It's it's one version of exposure therapy. Sure. But it's not the word on exposure no. therapy or trauma therapy. No. And so I, I, with EFT, I've always had this, that kind of slight resemblance. But anyway, go, continue well, your story. Yeah. Well, the reason I made up the mnemonic is because that's a pretty manualized treatment. Like it's pretty formalized. Yeah. Um, EFT. Yes. And so that was how I came to learn all this stuff cuz you know my my education is not in this. Yeah. Yeah. So um so I'm learning Your your education wasn't it didn't have the integrated or the set of theories that I was exposed to no. in, in graduate school. No. Yeah. It was yes, and in retrospect, if I could do it over again, I would I would have found a way to incorporate this. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, so that's that's my training, and um, so I wanted to try to remember this stuff because it's ugh, she's got she's got it manualized down to um, three stages and nine steps, and so this is essentially I called it step two, but Lori sort of tweaked it a bit, and she's like, I don't think it's step two. Then now it's what they call move two. It doesn't really matter. It's just EFT jargon. Okay. It's just that form of EFT jargon. It's a way to think about things, and it's a way to. Um, um, help remember and orient to where am I in my therapy process in this case with couples so she liked it she asked if she could use it she credited me in a slide I've been in three or four trainings with her since I made that thing up and she always puts that slide up and she says oh and Bob Gettle's here right now and I'm yeah yeah hi how do you know so what's the mnemonic it's what's the cue what's your body do but isn't a mnemonic like a a phrase or a word? Or? It's just a, It's just something to help a person remember. Oh, oh it's like a, it, it's, it rhymes. It rhymes. This so one's say it a again? rhyming mnemonic. Uh, what's the cue? What's your body do? What's it say to you? What do you do? Now own that it's true. Wow. So now say this all to your partner. Oh, right. I'm freaking out because you did this and it makes what's me... What's the cue? What's your body do? What's it say to you? What's it say to you? What do you do? And now... Now own it's true. And that it's true. Yeah. yeah. And so instead of you're a big jerk face, it's like, oh, you know what? I'm in that thing where I do, where I tell myself you're a big jerk face and it makes me want to go on the attack with you. Right. I'm in it right now. It's really great because it disarms people. Telling people that I have an action tendency is, sorry, let me try that again. Saying to my partner that I'm reacting and I have this action tendency, but not doing the action is really useful. It's, it um, deescalates things. Mm-hmm. And that's the point. So I wanted to try to remember all that, so I made up this little rhymer thing, and um, she liked it. She incorporated it in training. I didn't know Sue Johnson used it. I I didn't know it got that far. I know Lori's pretty highfalutin, but I don't, you know. She and I, we've crossed paths a half dozen times, and I love her. She's awesome, but I didn't know it, it went any further than her. It's interesting and commendable that Lori um, credits you because she yeah. easily could have just 
modified it yeah. in the way that we do yeah. as humans or presenters or teachers. I mean, I, we as a teacher, I do it all the time. If I had to cite every single oh, person no. that I learned something from, right. <laughs> it would never end, right? Yeah. And so uh, it's extremely commendable that she would yeah. put your name on she's, the slide. She's lovely. If you ever get a chance to take a training from Lori Britt Baker, totally worth it. She's really lovely. Is she associated with a outfit, some sort of training outfit? Uh, all the EFT people, they they're the EFT actually, Foundation or or whatever it is, yeah, yeah, yeah EFT Institute or something. Yeah, she's one of the one of the higher ups up there, and she's written some books, and she's just in her own. She's just wonderful, really cool. Bob, what is the difference between a favorite person for someone with borderline personality disorder versus a normal person? Um. Hmm. I'm pretty sure I fall somewhere on the borderline personality sort of, wait, what, what's going on? Uh, let me start over. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I fall, so the anonymous patron, she says, I'm pretty sure I fall somewhere on the borderline personality sort of spectrum, okay. and my husband is my favorite person. Oh. What is the difference between having a favorite person with or without borderline? When does it go from normal to problematic? Do you know what anonymous patron is asking? I'm not sure, but I can still take a run at it. But okay. I'm not exactly sure what they're asking. Well, let me give it. Let me try to interpret what I sure. think she's asking, which All is right. that she recognizes that she's on the borderline spectrum, meaning that she has relational traumas, betrayal, abandonment traumas, and is very, you know, will tend to uh, idealize, devalue the person, particularly spouses, right? And be very preoccupied and very focused on that person, um, very concerned with, do they love me? Are they going to leave me? A, a, a desperation, if you will. Yeah. And uh, so there's, in light of that, she's saying, I, have a, I consider him to be my favorite human being on the planet. Mm -hmm. Is it truly that I prefer him? Like my as a favorite human being or is it out of desperation that I am trying to get my needs met or trying to heal through this relationship or is it my idealization distortion that makes me believe he's this wonderful person when in reality there's some other kind of vibe that I should be having that's the way I'm interpreting yeah, it yeah I think that's probably how they mean it yeah what's I, your that was, that was my thought too what's your there. answer to that so she's saying um uh, when does it go from normal to idealize your partner to become problematic? Well, I don't know. I'd say this, though. Do you feel safe? Do you feel safe like to voice a complaint? Do you feel safe to talk about a sexual preference? Do you feel safe to have a disagreement? Um, um, want Mexican when he wants Greek food and assert that preference, not, and assert that preference, um, if you don't feel safe, then maybe you got this thing where, you know, that, that sort of idealizing thing where, where the idealization is functional as opposed to, oh, I hate that I'm saying it this way, excuse me, genuine. Because, mm -hmm. you know, of course, on the other hand, it's your spouse. My spouse is my favorite person too. I love Kirk, but, <laughs> but, but um, Colleen's my fave. And, um, you know, you could say the same thing to me. You say, well, Bob, is that, you know, is there an element of idealization? Because you're kind of on the borderline spectrum too, right? And I'd say, yeah, that's true. I, I am. My therapist probably going to laugh if he hears this one. But um, um, Why would so, he laugh? Because he doesn't use that language? He didn't use that language. I, I, <laughs> I think that's actually kind of fun. But, but anyways, um, so, so if you feel safe enough to voice difference or preference or um, assertion or whatever, then, you know, who cares? But if, if you notice that you edit or you censor or you hold yourself back or you, you know, avoid saying what you want or how you feel about stuff or you um, privilege the relationship and that's, I, I don't like saying it this way either, and that, that's fallen out of balance, um, where it's too much him and not enough you, then maybe maybe you want to take a peek at that, but, you know, maybe he's also just your favorite person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think, Anonymous Patron, what you're uh, concerned about is I hear about idealization with people with borderline, and I feel like I might be idealizing my husband. Does that mean it's wrong? 
And what I'll say is that everyone does this, you know, regardless of personality disorder. <laughs> we all are desperate for our partners to love us and to approve of us. Uh, it's just that borderline people have a heightened version of that because they were traumatized in the opposite uh, when they were young. So there's nothing unusual about uh, depending or um, distorting or idealizing or, or needing or something. So there's that. Um, I think that's all I'll say about that, yeah. All right. right on. Listener Brittany from Syracuse says, when I was younger, I regularly went to therapy, and on the final session, my therapist had me committed against my will to a crisis center. Oh, my. Being that I was still a child, I didn't understand that what was happening or why it was happening, and my experience there traumatized me mm. at the crisis center. My therapist, she told me anything I said to her would be confidential as a result. I felt so betrayed that I refused to see her. So, sorry. She told me anything I said to her would be confidential. And as a result, mm -hmm. I felt so betrayed that I refused to see her on any other ther or any other therapist afterwards. Oh, I see. So she's saying, yeah. when I went to her, she said everything was to be confidential. But then uh, on this session, she had me involuntarily committed against my will as a teenager. She had to blab to somebody. And probably told the crisis center right. what was the content of the therapy sessions. Yeah. And I felt so betrayed, I refused to see her again or any other therapist. My problem now is that I recognize I may need to seek therapy again, but I feel so much anxiety at the thought of it. My body is tense now, even just writing this to you, since I know you are also a therapist. I'm curious, do I need therapy to see a therapist? I know the simple answer is just to face my fear, but I don't know how, but I don't know how to. Bob, what do you think? Um, yeah, that is a simple answer, isn't it? Um, and don't know how to, um, well, actually you probably do know how to, it's, even as I listen to what you wrote, it sounds to me like you've got a really good grasp of what's needed and it just scares the hell out of you, which makes complete sense that it would. So, you know, the, my old mantra, every time I come on this thing, I say the same thing. Oh, you got to talk about that. Yep. You got to talk about that. You got to talk about that with your therapist. I think as you interview people, letting them know that this is the case is um, useful, um, important, because they're gonna, if they don't know it, it just seems like it sets the table for, you know, not that they're gonna betray your confidence, but that um, um, if that card's not on the table, they could run roughshod over you, even if they don't mean to, or it could land that way for you. So having um, that on the table and being overt about that, and then the two of you is working very conscientiously to look, look after you in your fear, because you deserve to be looked after in your fear, um, makes sense. You can always go slow. You don't have to have hour-long meetings once a week. You could do them on the phone, or you could start with email, or you could... Um, yeah. So, so, but, but there's probably no getting out of um, being afraid. There's just, and it's likely that um, with the good therapist that the experience is corrective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the only thing I'll add to what Bob is saying is, uh, to reiterate what Bob is saying is that it's rough and it's catch 22 in order to yeah. get therapy you need therapy to get therapy yeah uh, in order to trust therapists you have to get therapy so you can trust therapists and i get that and there's a lot of people in your situation Brittany. there's a lot of people who have been traumatized by therapists or by situations in therapy yeah and to a larger extent there are a lot of people who have been traumatized by humans and caretakers, and they have a really hard time trusting therapists because they're also human caretakers. So it's a common fear. There's nothing unusual about it, and you're normal to have those fears. Uh, if, it's any, if it's any kind of help, Brittany, if you're an adult now, which I think you are, uh, the chance of this happening is extremely small. You yeah. know, the, the kinds of things that you'll get involuntarily hospitalized for are if you are imminently at risk of harming, of killing yourself or someone else. Uh, uh, there, are, There's nuance to that, but there's a pretty high bar yeah. uh, for involuntary hospitalization for anyone. I'm guessing that 
uh, and maybe if you were to talk through what happened to you as a teenager, it might help you to trust therapists. You know, there's a chance that your therapist overstepped, um, which uh, could have happened. But there's a possibility that because uh, I've talked with a lot of teenage uh, people who are adults looking back at their teenage years, and they'll tell me a story about what happened to them in therapy. And I will say, oh, I bet you I know what happened. You know, I'll ask them, do you think you said this? Do you think you might have said that? And they'll be like, well, I might have. And I'll say, well, because you said those things, it meant that your therapist had to do these things. And you weren't aware of that at the time or you were really struggling and just hoping that no one would do anything. The other thing you know, that might be happening for you, Brittany, is that it might have been a good thing that you went to the crisis center. It might have been a bad experience that you had there, but it might have actually been the right decision. But through your 15-year-old eyes, it was a terrible decision. But from a 25-year-old or a 35-year-old position, you might be like, well, maybe I did need that. Maybe it was a wake-up call or, you know, who knows? I, I'm not going to no. claim that they're always good experiences. But um, having some differentiation around that story might help you to trust the system a little bit more. Having said that, it's not like all therapists are great. <laughs> uh, but the chance of you being explicitly harmed in a similar way is is not likely. The other thing you can do is before you talk to a therapist is tell them the story and just say, yeah. um, you know, what's the likelihood that you're going to involuntarily hospitalize me? Uh, do you do you care about confidentiality? How how badly do you care about confidentiality? Oh, these are great questions because when people ask me that question, I. And even when they wouldn't ask me, I would come out real strong and say, I am extremely concerned with your confidentiality because I, I, I don't know how I got to this point. I don't know if someone taught me this or whatever, but the whole reason, there's a reason for, I feel like a lot of therapists forget why we have confidentiality. It's because we want clients to trust us. <laughs> we want clients to feel free to talk about things. And I feel like a lot of therapists, it's just this, um, busy work formality that they have to discuss and have disclosed and sign and they have to follow it, but they don't really internalize the, the curative elements of a confidential, safe place to talk about whatever's on your mind. And so I don't know when I started doing this. It was about, I don't know, it was 10 or 15 years ago. I started to um, really tell people as I talked about confidentiality, I said, number one, I am extremely protective of your confidentiality. I want you to feel safe to talk here. When I go to therapy, I don't want my therapist blabbing to other people. So I take it very seriously, even if you don't care. Even if you're like, I don't, I'm an open book, I don't care. I care because I don't want anything getting out of this room that doesn't need to go. And, and so um, the following examples are exceptions to that rule, but I will go kicking and screaming even on these issues. You know, child abuse, you tell me you're going to kill someone. Like, I will, I, I'm going to do everything I can to not break your confidentiality against your will. Oh, that's nice. Um, but if these things happen, I might have to. Yeah. But they're, and the other thing I would say is, but these situations are very rare. In fact, the last time I had to break confidentiality in this way was... 15 years ago or something. Jeez, I can't even remember. I know. It's, when? it's, it's, and, and the last time I remember doing this was I actually, so the kid, it was a family, but the, and the kid told me that he had abused a younger person, I think sexually. Mm. And I told him that I was going to have to talk, I was going to have to report him. And the family freaked out. It was a whole thing, of course. Yeah. And then I said, but, if you make the call, family, particularly kid, if you make the call, this makes you look a lot better because you're telling me about it. You know, you're not shy telling me. So if someone's going to tell the authorities, it, it'd be a hundred times better if you're the one telling the authorities. And so we went back and forth around that. And eventually I got him to call CPS right there in, in session. Good. Um, so even in that situation, I didn't break confidentiality. He, he just reported himself, right. but I had to threaten him mm. essentially. Well, Not threaten, but tell him I had to break confidentiality. It was a strong orientation. Yeah. And so even in that situation, I still didn't do it. Yeah. And, and, and anyway, so um, Brittany, talk to your, you know, interview the therapist and find out. And then once you hire them, tell them 
you know, as often as you want to, look, I am extremely uh, traumatized by what happened to me when I was younger, when there was a massive breach in confidentiality, and I just want to check in, can I trust you? You know, and really just grill and drill your therapist until they demonstrate to you that, um, that they care. And if they don't pass a test, then fire them and hire someone else. Because honestly, if someone did that to me, I would be more than happy to prove myself that confidentiality matters to me. And then I would be very clear, these are the following things that legally I would have to break your confidentiality. And it would, it would look like something like this, it, you know, because that's another thing is like, you can tell a client, well, if I hear about child abuse, I have to report it. And then, but what does that mean? And I, it right. would look, it would sound like something like this. You would tell me that your niece, you saw your niece being beaten with a, a, a brick by her father or something, or you saw huge bruises on your nephew's body and uh, knew that your sister was violent at times. You know, it would be, and you told me about it. it. It'd be something like that. It would not be something like you heard that your um, your friend might be a little stern as a parent. You know, th those kinds of things do not prompt me to call the authorities you know so giving those specific examples because a lot of times people when they hear that they're like oh there's a pretty high bar because there is there's a pretty high bar for what would um, dictate or necessitate the the breaking of confidentiality anyway listener lauren says i listened to your episode about new therapists and i found out and I found it, I, sorry, I listened to your episode about new therapists, and I found it really resonated with my experience, but I still feel I am really struggling in my new career. I finished my graduate degree recently and was able to quickly secure a full-time position as a psychotherapist. I was prepped before being hired that I would be working independently for the most part, and I truly felt I was okay with this, but the last two months have been truly difficult. Uh... I usually don't have other therapists in the office with me, and I feel uncomfortable interrupting, interrupting the brief time they have between clients on the couple days they are in. I feel so incompetent and worry about doing harm to my clients. I have tried grounding myself before, during and after my sessions, and challenging my negative thoughts, but I still feel awful. I feel the most loss on applying clinical interventions in session and feel like I barely remember anything from graduate school to, despite having a really great despite having really great grades. Sometimes I close my office door and cry. Often I go home and cry. I currently meet with a supervisor twice a week, changing from once a week due to these concerns, and she tells me she has no doubts about my clinical knowledge and emphasizes to me that this is normal uh, as a normal experience and it will get better. But deep down I don't believe it. I have also been meeting with my own therapist for over three years now and receive the same feedback. I feel bad for those around me trying to convince me I am okay and being helpful, but I truly worry I have made a mistake going into this field and will not be a good therapist ever. I love talking about mental health and helping others, but worry my clinical knowledge and oversharing and lack of social skills will harm others or even myself professionally. I am currently looking into additional training as a new graduate, I but as a new graduate, I don't have a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Will this feeling pass? Is it normal to feel so much regret and anxiety about becoming a therapist? Bob, what do you think? I'd say there's probably a range of uh, experience uh, of young young or new therapists. So, but this sounds like you know within the range. Have you felt this? I don't recall. I don't recall feeling this anxious. I. That's not true. I don't recall ever shutting my door and crying. I never had that experience. But I, I do have had, I have had many experiences of worry about what am I doing and what is my job and um, benefiting from really terrific supportive supervision, which I don't, without that and um, the support of... What, were, what was it about supervision that made it helpful along these lines when you were new as a therapist? The kinds of reassurances that are being described here in this note um, I received from my supervisor and then some direct advice about what to do. Yeah. Um, um, I remember one time 
it was, it was maybe three years, two or three years after I finished school. And I was meeting with my supervisor who I met with for 10 years. Uh, fabulous man. I'd love that guy. Um, and I said to him, I think my job is just to love this client. And he said, yeah. And then he said, he was, he was a beautiful soul. He was an adventurous spirit. He said to me one time, I said, I said, David, I, I'm, I think I'm a half step behind this client. And he said, with a smile on his face, he said, yeah, Bob, that's what's great about being in practice is you're going to work with people who are actually further along than you are. And it is going to challenge you. That's what's cool about it. Not what's wrong with it. He just, he had a beautiful spirit like that. And he, anyways, um, um, keep breathing. Write us in a year. Yeah. 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 Uh, as Bob said, it's normal. It sounds extreme. Um, it seems above average. Yeah. Sounds like trauma to me. I mean, you're in therapy. You're talking to your supervisor twice a week. You're getting all this reassurance oh, yeah. that you're okay. Yeah. But there's still this nagging voice telling you that you're screwing up or you're insufficient or you're you're going to harm someone or something. Kind of like that film we talked about. Yeah, with Violet. I don't know if that'll come out before or after the, this conversation. But yeah. but yeah, so I would really try to target that. Yep. The other thing that I would do, and I don't, so there's two things. One is mentorship, and the other thing is is exposure. So mentorship-wise, uh, if your supervisor doesn't really inspire you to believe in yourself, you might want to think about getting another supervisor or something. Yeah. Um, or f another mentor, not a maybe like a, an additional um, you know, seasoned person who's been around the block a few times who you can talk to you know, every now and then just mm -hmm. to help you and, and really inspire you. Because it's one thing, so there's two versions of this that I've seen from supervisors. One is, is supervisors like, you're good, everything's fine. Yeah. Anyway, moving on, let's talk about your paperwork. Right. <laughs> the other the other supervisor is a true mentor and really is yeah. let's talk about this. What's going on? You know? Tell me and because it's one thing to just say, No, you're fine, everything's yeah. good. It's another thing to kind of and I find that this actually is therapy to to a large extent as well, mm -hmm. is it's one thing to tell someone, Well, that thought is irrational, you know, uh, let's move on. Or, oh, that's your attachment style, let's move on. It's another thing to be like, let's really get into the muck here mm -hmm. and wade through the swamp that is your personality step by step. Yeah. And what's going on there? What do you think about that? What do you think about what I said? What do you think about me? What do you think about you? What do you think about other people? How do you feel? What's happening right now? You know, really slogging through it. And as a mentor supervisor myself, that's what I would do. I mean, I would spend potentially five weeks in a row talking with a supervisee about their insecurities. Yeah. Um, even though the topic sentence is, you have an irrational fear or you have a internalized voice from your mother that is not helpful. You know, like that's the, or you're, you're, you're fine, but you don't believe you're fine. Right. You know, like uh, knock it off. Like that's the topic sentence. But to really... Uh, help someone I think you have to spend the time to really yeah. kind of slog through all the manifestations and the the irrationalities around the irrationalities and so that's one the second thing is is exposure and I would do this with people as well of just like well fuck it what if you screw things up yeah let's say you do fail tell me a scenario where you fail you know let's let's walk through this let's uh, tell me a client that, that you're concerned about well there's this one client where like, okay Give me a scenario that's reasonable. Well, what if they kill themselves uh, because I didn't catch it? Okay, so let's let's say let's let's a reasonable scenario. Uh, you get a call that they've died from suicide. Okay, then what? Well, well, I will have failed, and I'll be like, yeah, okay, you failed. Now what? Well, but I failed. Uh, someone died because of me. No, they died because of their suicide. You might have dropped the ball on assessment or noticing something. And, and you're under supervision, so that's partly my fault too, by the way, just so you know. <laughs> but, um, okay, now what? You failed. Someone died from suicide, at least partially because of your 
inadequacy. Now what? You know, because the irrational thoughts rarely go beyond that point. Right. You know, it's just like, well, there's this big black abyss beyond that. It's like, right. no, there's a reality beyond that. Um, the worst case scenario, you get sued and you your malpractice kicks in and you get sanctioned and they make you take more classes on suicide prevention or something. Life goes on. Or you decide that you can't be a therapist anymore and you become a car salesman. Who cares? It's not the end of the world. <laughs> like, and your parents think you're a failure. Who cares? Like, they, they don't know how hard it is to be a therapist. You know, like, let's walk ourselves through this. And, and so that's another thing, you know, potentially to do, Lauren, is to, you know, just really walk through and have some, a mentor who can really walk you through that and really show you, like, the thing that you're afraid of is possible. You know, because what I find that what bad mentors will do is, Nothing bad will ever happen. Everything's going to be fine. You're, you're okay. And it's like, that's not exactly true. Bad things might happen. The therapist, Lauren, might fail as a, any therapist sure. at any stage of career might fail. That's not the point. The point is what the valence around that failure, around that possible catastrophe, which could happen. What So what is the thing? And I feel like one of the things that I as a, privileged male can give uh, people because often my supervisees are women is this idea of just like this male masculine privilege of fuck it i messed up deal with it (laughs) you know like uh, not that i'm wonderful around failure i'm not but there's an attitude that i have about things like this that I i i feel like it's a masculine part of me of I make mistakes and screw you, you know? Yeah, I made a mistake. Deal with it. <laughs> like, I didn't mean to. I didn't, you know, it wasn't, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to cry myself to sleep every night because I made a mistake, you know? I made a mistake and I, I didn't mean to. I'll try not to do it again, but moving on, you know? I, I don't know. Does that feel masculine to you in, yeah. in good ways and bad ways in some well, ways? Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like for a lot of the women that I would work with as supervisees, they did not have that voice inside their head. There was no voice inside their head of, well, yeah, I made a mistake. Deal with it. <laughs> I'm sorry. Let's move forward. You know, I, I feel like women are taught that they have to fix it that, and they have to um, martyr themselves or I don't know, or put themselves put their own head in the guillotine or something yeah. throughout life and to be a therapist you have to be able to withstand that those possibilities cuz people can die and, or people can be harmed people can walk away from therapy thinking you're a terrible therapist and that's you just have to it's not a wonderful thought but as a mentor, I feel like I can kind of download that into my supervisees sometimes mm-hmm. of just that bravado. And, and I'm not saying to be irresponsible. I'm not no. saying to be callous, but you need some counterweight to the crushing worries of what could happen. Sure. Of trying to have a career where you never fail. Or what are we kidding? Yeah. Have you had failures, Kirk? Yeah. I have. Yeah. Many. Yeah. And so, the more confident I get, the more able I am to admit it. Yeah. Right. You know, one of the thoughts that occurred to me while I was listening is we just have a couple data points here. We have the feedback that Lauren's people are giving her, the therapist and the mentor uh, or the supervisor. Um, And then we have Lauren's um, thoughts that are, you know, sort of counter to what the feedback is that she's getting. And so the two thoughts I had is, well, what is the function of believing that you are failing? Like, let's presume that it is non-rational. Okay. What's its function? What's it trying to do for you? Probably trying to protect you somehow or other, but but okay. So, um, and then the other is, um, oh crap, it flew out of my head. <laughs> I wonder if I wonder if we, you and me, are sort of invited into the into the mindscape. Yeah, by having by commenting on you know, like my comment was you know basically basically what the th- supervisor is saying. You know, I don't know that that's all that helpful for Lauren to hear. Um, um, I definitely like the notion of, okay, 
maybe you are. Right. Yeah. Yeah. To just, <laughs> I, I find that to be extremely liberating because there's so much paralyzation in our yeah. lives around what if I fail? Yeah. And then I'm just like, well, fuck it. What if you fail? Who cares? Yeah. <laughs> like, try your best not to fail. But yeah, you might fail. So what? Who, and the other thing that I'll say to people is what makes you so special to think that you're not going you're to not fail? Gonna fail? Are you that narcissistic to believe that you're not going to fail? Yeah. You are going to fail. Yeah. Stop thinking you're not going to fail. Stop acting like you're special yeah. of a person that you're never, because I feel like first, I don't know if Lauren's like this, but I feel like there are some therapists who narcissistically hold themselves to this high standard because they, they feel that they're special. You know, if I said to them, do you think therapists have failed before they're like yeah of course well what makes you different from them yeah and i think there's this narcissistic notion of like that they wouldn't say is like braggadocious but like they're special but they hold themselves to this different standard you know <laughs> yeah it's when it's like the shadow side of narcissism right right yeah it's and I, I'm, I'm like what makes you think you're so special you know this is what i do to my students as well that I will show them the learning curve, and I've talked about this before. Uh, I'll say, you know, here's the learning curve of how to become a good therapist. And I'm 25 years in, and I'm like, say, 60% up the curve. Um, over the next 25 years, I'll continue to learn, and I'll continue to, to improve as a therapist and gain in knowledge and expertise and experience and wisdom. And it's taken me a long time to get to this place. Oh, long time. So where was I when I was in your shoes? Oh. Well, I was like 3% up the, I'm 60% up now. At your stage, I was 3%. So um, you as a student, and because you know some students are even pre-internship, right. I'm like, you are inherently incompetent as a therapist. <laughs> You don't know anything. Uh, How could you? Uh, Do you think that you would be at my level 25 years in with two masters and a doctorate and a, all this experience of being a professor and a podcaster? Do you, know, do you think you should be 60% or even 100% down the learning curve? How many hours do you think you spent as a therapist? Like over 25 years. Yeah. I mean, I was full-time. You were uh, more than full-time when you started. Right. Uh, for you know, fifteen years or something. So that's, uh, I think, on average, maybe a thousand sessions a, a a year. So you know, it's probably twenty thousand sessions. You know, or something like that. They say it takes ten thousand hours to become an expert at anything. Right. So, and confident in anything, to some extent. Yeah. Too. So, um, and I, you know, I really kind of beat it into the student's head and I and I get different reactions from different students most students uh, will tell me that they appreciate it like yeah. oh, oh thank you I yeah. you, you've named something right. that I can now kind of laugh at and relax and just be like I'm going to sit in a cushy warm chair of incompetence because <laughs> why would I be competent sure I've been trying to act like I know what I'm doing because uh, and you know I, I I don't when people go to like I don't know what what's another thing that people learn how to do like dentistry. Okay, dentistry. I, I have a hard time believing that first year dentistry students believe that they should already be good at dentistry, right? They I would imagine that they're like I have no idea what I'm doing because I haven't been to school yet. But there's something about therapists because it's such an amorphous sort of human oh, yeah. ex, human field about right. like listening and healing that. Students believe that they should already be good prior to learning and prior to being supervised, prior to getting getting any experience. And so, uh, you know, I will really kind of beat it into their head of like, that's wrong. That's wrong thinking. It's distorted and it's narcissistic. Knock it off. You are 3% down the road because of your life experiences and the classes you've taken up until this point. Maybe 10%. Who knows? But, Maybe. But... You're pretty far yeah. from the point I'm at. And because yeah. the other thing that students will do is they'll compare themselves to me. Like I'll demonstrate uh, how to be a therapist and they'll be like, oh my God, you, you just know what to do. And they just, they'll, I feel so inadequate. And I'm like, I was in the exact same place I was when I was in your shoes, you yeah. know? And, and I slogged through years and years of education and experience to get where I am today. So, so that's another thing, you know, Lauren, to think about is just like, 
maybe your anxiety stems from this distortion, this distorted view that somehow you're superior and above failure, which is ridiculous. Just kick back and say, I welcome the warm, cushy, uh, lazy chair of inexperience. I don't know what I'm doing. I have a big heart and I know some things and I know what to do kind of. And, I, and I'm gonna do my best and I'm gonna talk about it and I'm gonna fail and I'm gonna succeed. And, but most of the time I'm not gonna know what I'm doing. And I'll trust my mentor in that one day I will feel like I know what I'm doing. And I'll look back and I'll say, I kind of always did know what I was doing, but I just didn't know that yet. Let's take a break, Bob, what do you say? I say break. All right, let's do an old patron praise. These people became patrons back in August of 2019 and have stayed patrons ever since then. Very wow. loyal. It's one thing to become a patron. It's another thing to be a loyal patron. A loyal patron. We have up at your patron Kathleen, who I believe used to send me short questions and doesn't do, any, do it anymore. So you don't send me flowers or short questions <laughs> anymore upper tier patron kathleen i think that's you uh wolfgang from germany of course uh marie from germany we have maria from the netherlands we have chris from great britain england we have allison from new york new york we have anna from australia we have aaron from colorado we have mackenzie from belleville ontario we have Ashley, from, who's an annual patron from Portland, Oregon. We have Jennifer from Pottstown, Pennsylvania. Oh, yeah. You know where that is? I do. What's it like there in Pottstown? Oh, well, I haven't been there since I was a kid, but if I remember right, um, uh, Blue Collar Coal Town. Oh, okay. Sarah from God Knows Where. Jasper from Australia. We have Ye, or you, from Oakland, California. We have Corey from God Knows Where. Mitchell from Seattle. We have Nikki from Fairmont, West Virginia. West Virginia. Josine from Ireland. Cork, Castle Town Bear, Ireland. I don't know. Julian from New Jersey. Matt from God Knows Where. And Mike from Germany. Thank you so much for becoming patrons and staying patrons all of this time. Let us go to another email. Listener Anna from Europe says, I am 36 years old. I'm 36 years old. And next week, I'm going to my first ever therapy session. Wow. I have a lot of childhood trauma, and mm -hmm. I feel an urge to talk about that. The problem is I never, ever talked about it with anyone. I hate being vulnerable. I never let anyone see me in not in control. I even gave birth twice without anyone present except for my midwife. I'm afraid that I am making a huge mistake and I might literally not handle being vulnerable in therapy. Just writing this email is making me extremely anxious. In your experience, are there people who just shouldn't go to therapy? Bob, what do you think? No. Uh, well, I don't know if there are people that shouldn't go to therapy, but what you've written is not evidence of anything except you're really nervous about being open and vulnerable, which actually, in a way, is really cool because it looks like that's your intention is to is to be open and vulnerable and also to expose yourself to the obstacles that come up to being open and vulnerable. And if you're anything in your session, like you are in your email, you're going to be candid about all that. That all bodes well. Sorry that you're scared. That sucks. Never a pleasant feeling, but I'm going to presume that you hired a good therapist. You're going to be okay. It's I'm sure terrifying to bungee jump or oh, yeah. go, go skydiving. Oh, I did that once. Skydiving? Yeah. Did you enjoy it? Uh, that's a great question. Yes. Was it worth it? Uh, yeah, it's kind of a life experience. It was really cool. But I'll tell you, that stepping out on the strut and then leaving the plane, I got it on video. They showed it. They, they, they did the video and then they re-edit it in slow motion you can see me going oh my god as i'm leaving the plane and then it was amazing. your tandem right your yeah tandem yeah yeah i wouldn't do that without yeah um uh and in unlike anything i've ever experienced and and um are you glad you did it oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. totally glad i never do it again 
<laughs> uh, but yes, glad I did it. Yeah. Well, maybe that's a bad analogy. But no, no, it's a good one. It's a good one. Well, the point is, is that vulnerability, the leap of faith with someone who is safe to do that with right. is a wonderful, glorious thing, even if you don't do it with someone that's safe, honestly. I mm. I mean, obviously, if someone's going to abuse you, that's not a great experience. But I find for myself that when I take the leap of faith of vulnerability, especially with someone who cares, then it's wonderful. And it's scary at the beginning. Yes. Um, but even if someone isn't great to talk to and isn't great as a validator or listener, I still feel better about getting things off my chest. And so, Anna, I I hear you, you know, you've, I'm guessing, been traumatized around vulnerability, learned it was better not to be. But now, you know, you're 36 years old and, and you know, there's a part of you that's like, I think I need to be vulnerable. Yeah. And that's a wonderful thing. Keep building on that. You know, take, take your time. Just going to therapy and just sitting there and talking about the weather is vulnerable. You don't have to, like, pour it all out in the first session. So there's that. Mm-hmm. The other thing is, is that you're talking about a lot of childhood trauma that you have an urge to talk about and you've never talked about it with anyone. There's a possibility that it's actually not safe to talk about it right away, that you need proper precautions around trauma therapy before you even mm. broach those topics. Yeah. So there's that. But yeah, vulnerability. You know, for me as a man, as a slightly avoidant man, as a Japanese American man, it's been a lifetime of learning how to be vulnerable and, and how to open up like that. And the podcast has helped, therapy has helped. Helping others be vulnerable has helped. Being in relationships like with you, Bob, or my wife helps. Um, So I get it, Anna. It's hard, but it's such a glorious thing. It's messy. It's vulnerable. It's scary. It's revealing. It's humiliating, kind of. I mean, humiliating, humbling is probably a better word. Humanizing. But it's a little humiliating, you know, mm-hmm. just like, oh, look at me. I'm a I'm a messy human with like emotions and urges and parts of me that aren't wonderful and and Instagrammable, you know. And <laughs> but it's such a it's such a better place to live, <laughs> Anna. It's the reality of the genuine human and all of our foibles, it's so relaxing and freeing freeing is the word. And I welcome you to join us, Anna. Patron Emma from Bucharest says, I chose not to have kids, and it was probably one of the reasons that led me to divorce, Mm. although I was always honest about not wanting kids. Mm. My current partner has a son, and I am delighted to have found a man who does not want to have more children. While I love kids, I never had a desire to have my own. I was curious what led you and Bob to choose not to have children, and if that has created any difficulties in your relationships. End of email. Well, the first thing I'll say, Bob, before you answer is people out there, including Patreon Emma, I have literally never talked about whether I have kids or not out of privacy reasons. So just because I haven't talked about kids doesn't mean I don't have kids. I'm not going to confirm or deny I have kids because of privacy reasons, but I get this sort of question frequently. People be like, how come you don't have kids? And I'm like, I've literally never said I don't have kids. So just because I've not talked about kids means I don't have kids. You know what I mean? Like, I also haven't talked about diarrhea. Does that mean I don't have diarrhea? (laughs) Do you? (laughs) The point is, is, uh, people, I, I... you, you don't know the answer to that question unless you know me in my well, personal life. I think we deserve to know. Do you have diarrhea or not? <laughs> so, um, so... Oh, uh, denial about that now, huh? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, I'll, I'll say that. But, Bob, you've talked about how you don't yes, have kids. Yes, I do not have children. So, um, it says here, I was curious what led you, Bob, to choose not to have children and if that has created any difficulties in your relationships. Bob, what do you think? No. I don't think it's created any difficulties. Um, uh, my partners, since I discovered I don't want to have children, have all been aware of that um, and known that going in. And so, you know, that, I think that can be a deal breaker um, when one person wants children and the other doesn't. My wife, Colleen, told me when we started, she knew I didn't want to have kids. And she said, well, 
I do want kids, but I prefer a partnership over that and you're okay. So she, she, she held on to me. Hmm. Um, Does that cause any problems? No. Though, you know, we got contacted um, about maybe five, six, seven years ago by uh, Washington State DSHS and the Department of Social and Health Services that there were um, a cousin's granddaughter, one of Colleen's cousin's granddaughters um, had a kid and that DSHS is looking for a uh, placement for that kid. Like, I don't, we don't know what the deal was, but you know, I, it might've been somebody had a drug problem or something. And they asked if we wanted this one-year-old. And I thought that'd be kind of interesting, you know, like maybe we could do that. Like maybe that would be really cool. Um, Colleen said, no, she didn't want to do that. Um, uh, so, so, okay. So I'm, I'm getting on a tangent. I don't have any regrets about not having kids. I chose not to have children because I didn't want to, um, I didn't want to hurt anybody who couldn't defend themselves. And I know me well enough to know that my temper can get the better of me. And I don't think anybody that can't defend themselves deserves to be on the receiving end of that. And I just decided that the buck stopped with me, but I'm not particularly attached to my DNA. So not having children and not, it's no big deal to me. Um, I'm glad I didn't. It was the right choice for me. Yeah. And well, you know what I find annoying? And I, I hope anybody that's my friends will forgive me for saying this. Is Everybody says to me, oh, you would have been a great dad. You know, I'm a good uncle. I'm a really good uncle, but uncles are like, they're like, they like come from the temp agency. Well, I feel like there are two messages that are being said when someone says that. One is, is they're complimenting you. There's, yeah. Um, and saying, you, you're a very nice person, yep. you're attentive, you're yep. fun. Yeah. You would have been a great dad. Sure. Um, and maybe in their mind they're thinking, that would have been fun to see you raise a child or, and see what yeah. that would have resulted in. Maybe, yeah. But I think another message is you should have been a dad yeah. because you, you have all this wasted uh, love that you're just casting on the stones. So... Uh, what do you think about that? Am I wasting my love on you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and do you have diarrhea or not? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, yeah, I think that's probably what bothers me about it is this under story that maybe yeah. they think I should have. So but, you're glad you didn't have kids? Yeah. How, how so? Um, well, I don't have to figure out how to pay college tuition. Like I watched my brother has four children. My brother has four children. I don't know how the hell he does it. And they're smart kids, so they're, you know, going through post-high school education and they ain't going to cheap places, and I don't know how he does it. I don't have that headache. And um, what was the question? Uh, why do you not regret it? Why do you enjoy the fact that you made that choice long ago? Like, what benefits do you the, the main benefit for me is I know I didn't hurt anybody. Hmm. Like, some beautiful defenseless child who you know then they're 15 and then they're 18 and then they're 21 though if i had had kids i think at 21 22 i probably would have sat him down with a beer and said you know i screwed up i made this mistake and this mistake and this mistake and i'm really sorry and i i'm open to whatever feedback you have for me however you know that's how, how you've been impacted by me and my troubles in life um this ought to be a safe enough place for you to talk to me about that. So if you need to, I'm right here. I haven't heard of too many parents who've, who, who do that, but I think that that's a real good... I shouldn't presume that because I'm a parent that my mistakes can be um, um, ignored by... I mean, what relationship do we ignore our mistakes? Like, show me the one where that's a really good idea. All right. So I don't know why parenting would, would be so sacred that uh, one couldn't talk about ones. Yeah, and while we're on the topic, I mean, you can have that conversation with a five-year-old. Uh, it's a different version. Yeah, it is a different version. You can talk with a five-year-old and just say, hey, you know, the other night I lost my temper. I lost my temper. It's not okay. It's not okay. I'm sorry to you. 
um, I'm, I'm, I'm working on it, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. 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 One can and one should. Yeah. Anyways, um, I, the main thing that I take, the, the main pleasure I take is I didn't hurt anybody. Mm. I think some listeners would be saddened by that. I, 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 I just I, don't give a shit. What? I don't care. What do you mean? I don't care if anybody's sad about the fact that I'm glad I didn't hurt somebody. I don't care. <laughs> right. But I, to, to kind of double down. Sure. Uh, Why at, not? At the risk of pissing you off. <laughs> um, I think that what they would say is, but, you know, we all hurt our kids. Uh, we all will make mistakes. Sure. Um, that seems like a real kind of deficit model of, you know, it's like, I don't want to go on vacation because I don't want to accidentally eat the wrong thing or, or you know what I mean? It's like, do. That, that's really kind of focusing on the slight negatives instead of, oh, yeah. instead of um, focusing on what the good that could have happened. Well, at least I'm consistent. Yeah. Uh, I think what is being left out of the equation here is how angry I can get and how that can rule me. And if you haven't seen it, you don't know what that's like. Hmm. So, you know, the people in the podcast here, they, they get to see a side of me and I, I am as honest as I know how to be, but being honest about being angry and actually showing how angry I can get are two different animals. So anybody that says that hasn't seen me and it, it's, um, I'm, I'm ashamed of some of the things that I've done when I'm angry and, uh, I'm very glad that I haven't done to a little person what were done to me. And I know I would have. Yeah. I probably would have been better than what what I experienced, but not good enough. Yeah. And so the buck stopping with me is, it's fine. Mm -hmm. I get my generativity needs met in other ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, think of all the love and shepherding that you've done over your lifespan yeah the people that you've helped on the podcast as well yeah yeah that's all good so so you know i appreciate on the other hand i do i appreciate the sentiment and the vote of confidence and i think in some ways i would have been a really good parent but this other thing is just to me it's far more important yeah all right well oh shit that was deep or heavy or something i <laughs> Is it ever not? I guess. And everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. <laughs>